Okay, we'll crack on. Good. So, uh, we've talked about this. So just to absolutely anchor this in your minds, okay? If you won the lottery tonight and you processed the experience well, you could get over your metaphobia in about a week, okay? So if you won the lottery tonight and you won 10 million on the lottery, okay? And you processed it really well. You really understood that your life has changed. All right, for some external reason, to be fair. But your life has changed completely now. You can have so much more control over your life now. And your life is so much more predictable now. You've got all those millions of pounds. Your self-esteem would go up. Your locus of control would be much more internal. And you couldn't maintain a metaphobia if you had an internal locus of control. So just by winning the lottery, if you processed it right... That alone could get you over your metaphobia. But of course, you wouldn't process it right because you'd process it completely externally at the moment. And that's kind of the point. Equally, if you meet Brad Pitt in a coffee shop this afternoon, he chats you up and he takes you out on a date tonight, your self-esteem might go through the roof. If he says, do you know what? I love you. I'm leaving Angelina. She gets on my nerves anyway, all these foreign kids and that. I want to marry you. Let's get married next week. I'll get divorced later on. And your self-esteem goes really high and stays high. You cannot have a metaphobia and high self-esteem. So if you're going to keep your self-esteem high, your metaphobia will go. Yeah? You cannot have high self-esteem and a metaphobia because to have high self-esteem would also require you having an internal locus and you cannot have a metaphobia and an internal locus. So if, you're, if your self-esteem is high and it stays high, you cannot have a metaphobia. So these external things, this is why it sometimes is unpredictable and talking to a few of you uh, in the coffee break and knowing a few of you previously, when, when your metaphobia symptoms seem to kind of come and go randomly, it's because these little changes, like you meet a new boyfriend, you get a new job, you do this, you start drinking at a different pub, all sorts of minor little changes create fluctuations in your belief systems and your thinking styles because of the way you react to them. Okay? Now, the two people in the room that I know are quite rich, and you're thinking, well, how come I haven't got a bloody internal locus and I'm loaded? You didn't process it well. You know who you are. Okay? You have to process it well. You've got to process wealth in an internal way, in the way that makes you realise that your choices in life are much easier having loads of money, which they are, particularly if you've got fear. Okay? Everyone happy? Good. Moving on. So this is really important. I mentioned to you earlier about the, um, in relation to the ghost question, when someone's got an external locus of control in an area, and let's be honest, even the worst of you, mind you, did you speak to someone that scored 29 on the quiz? I mean, how did you even find the quiz if you scored 29? Don't answer the question, okay? Let's say you scored on average 25. You're still very internal in five of those areas, okay? Very internal in five of those areas. But... So in those 25 other areas where you're external, what happens when someone is external is you lose the ability to have critical thinking because you've attributed an external, magical, fatalistic reason for something happening. And once you've done that, you meet a dead end. Okay? So if you're very external generally, let's say you're not in a meta, but you're, gen you're generally very external, and that's the kind of stuff you believe. That's the, way, that's the kind of way you think. Okay? and you think you've seen the ghost of Elvis, you are far more likely to interpret that as the ghost of Elvis than someone who's internal, who doesn't believe in that sort of stuff. You're far more likely to interpret it in a magical way than someone that doesn't generally interpret things in a magical way. That's not hard to understand, is it? In the same way as, generally speaking, emetophobes are optimists, they're positive people, okay, which is actually unhelpful for you, and we'll talk about that later, but generally speaking, emetophobes are positive, optimistic people Generally speaking, in other areas of your life, you don't see things in a negative or pessimistic way. That's just what you do. You're generally quite positive, generally quite optimistic. Okay? That's a way of processing experiences in your life. People with an external locus of control always look outside, always look for a magical, fatalistic, nonsense reason for something that's happened. You do it automatically. You don't think about it. Okay, you do it automatically. The way if I threw a Lego piece to Stephen there, he's going to try and catch it. Thank you, mate. 
who's going to try and catch it because the, you're in the habit of doing that. Someone throws you a ball, you try and catch it. Okay, it's automatic. We didn't rehearse that, did we? If we'd rehearsed it, he'd have caught the <laughs> flipping thing. <laughs> flipping thing. That's terrible. You've no idea how difficult this is for me, Layla. Not swearing's very difficult for me, love, but I'm doing all right. I'm getting lots of pats on the back from people <laughs> during the coffee breaks. So, when we process something, when we give something an external reason, you lose the ability for critical thinking. Let me give you an example. I know we've done this before. Let me give you an example, right? So, it's, uh, it's four o'clock in the morning. You're at home. It's four o'clock in the morning, and uh, it's pouring down with rain outside and your partner has a stinking headache they've got a terrible terrible migraine they're in a lot of pain okay they ask you to get up and go to the local all-night tesco's and buy them some migraine tablets some neurofen or something okay so you get up you get dressed get in the car you drive to the local tesco's pouring down with rain not a single car in the car park okay would you park in the disabled bay out the front or would you park in the main body of the car park now, guests today only, not TCs, guests today only, would you park in the disabled bay? Put your hands up. Good on you. Uh, hands up if you wouldn't have done. Okay, so, so the vast majority, okay? So the vast majority. Now, those of you that put your hands up, is that because you've got a blue sticker anyway? <laughs> <coughs> in, in any way, shape or form, yeah? Hanging out with Claire in, in Newquay last weekend. I'm thinking, where's your park? Where's your park? She doesn't matter. I've got my sticker. We can park wherever we want to. Because <laughs> you can't see very well. Are we can park anywhere not. So, um, the point is, those of you that wouldn't park in the disabled bay, because you are so used to following rules, and it's, a, you know, it's, it's social anxiety, it's obedience to authority, it's all of these things, what happens is, oh, I can't park there. I have to park over here. Even though, and I'm glad I'm not your partner, right? Because if I'm at home in bed with a terrible, terrible migraine and a lot of catastrophic pain, and because of your bloody social anxiety, you're going to make me wait another 10 minutes <laughs> for the tablets just because you didn't want to park in the disabled bay at the front. There's, there's like 10 bays at the front of the shop, okay? And there's not a single car in the car park unless there's some kind of disabled cruise going round <laughs> and suddenly a load of people are going to turn up or a blind driver's convention or something... The chance of all those spaces being needed is pretty remote, but yet you still not will not take that risk. Okay, so rule orientated. Okay, that's an external decision-making process because what happens? You say oh, I can't park there, and you come to that dead end up there. What's happening to me? Can't park there, dead end. When we process something as external, we lose that ability for critical thinking. You know, because if it's a rule, you don't then challenge it. That's the point. If it's, oh, it's a rule, don't park there. But actually, when you process it internally, you think entirely differently about it. Well, maybe I could park there. Maybe, maybe actually, as it's 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, and my partner is technically disabled. You know, I understand that the disabled bay isn't necessarily for people that can't necessarily just walk, but it might be for people that are in a lot of pain. It might be for people that have got a broken leg or something. Well, my partner's a bit disabled at the moment, and uh, you know, I want to get in there now quickly. Maybe you might think to yourself, well... I understand the reason for the rule, but actually it's four o'clock in the morning, there's nobody around, I should be allowed to park there. But also maybe, if it's around social anxiety, maybe you can say to yourself, look, you know, even if the manager does come out and tell me off, or the one-legged car park attendant does come and have a go at me, because I've always got one leg for some reason, okay, maybe I've got the skills to argue. Maybe I'm not terrified with the manager saying, oi, you, you can't park there. And actually, I wouldn't feel terrified. I'd say, actually, do you know what? I'm only going to be a minute, mate. I just need to get some tablets. My partner's got a stinking headache. But if there's high social anxiety, a high obedience to authority, or just a strong obedience to following rules, because it's safer that way, you won't park in the disabled bay. And that's a classic example of an external attribution. It's a rule, therefore you don't break it. So I, I asked Fiona, stand up, Fiona. Stand up. Say thank you. Sit down. I asked Fiona <laughs> to get to get me a cup of tea this morning. As, as I'm getting, I can get you, Rob, because she's very helpful. I said, "Can you get me a cup of tea?" She said, "I can't. They wouldn't let me." You know, it's like, it's like a, that's not like a, a God-made rule, is it? They wouldn't let me. You know, someone says you can't have a cup of tea. So some people have that obedience just to someone issuing a rule or something of the white coat kind of syndrome, the doctor syndrome. Yeah. 
Sorry, all right, you did do it. You did, she did. Well, I said to her, look, this is your opportunity to, to challenge these rules and things. So, when somebody process something externally, or the moment you give an external attribution, so the moment you're external and say, look, obviously, it's the ghost of Elvis, you don't then say to yourself, but it could be a whole load of other reasons might that be. Let's have a look at what they could be. You've given it a reason. It's the ghost of Elvis. That's it. You've given your metaphobia a reason. It's because you were sick when you were five. You've given your fear of dogs a reason because I was bitten by a dog when I was six. The moment you've given an external reason, that's it. You don't even think about it anymore because you've given it a reason. It's like we know that, uh, we know that the sun's going to come up today because it always does. Therefore, we're not going to sit and ponder why the sun's come up today. So it's a kind of a fait accompli in your thinking, isn't it? Once you give something an external reason or an external um, attribution, you then stop questioning it. And what happened when you're all about six or seven, you gave your fear of being sick an external reason and just never questioned it since and just reinforced it a thousand times a day for the last 120 years, in Mary's case. So what happens is, if you take somebody then who's got a, uh, a, the belief that they have seasonal affective disorder, that the cold, dark winter evenings makes them feel down and depressed, which is obviously, as you know, complete nonsense. But let's say they have that belief, and let's say that, let's say that is um, James here, and James and I are going to go for a walk outside now, and it's dark outside, and it's clouds, and it's raining. And let's say James and I both get a bit depressed walking across London this weather. Okay? Now let's say I've got an internal locus, and let's say for sake of argument, James has got an external locus. I'm going to say to myself, oh, Rob, what are you doing to make yourself depressed? Which would get the answer, well, you're brooding about the weather. Well, you're going to be in a nice warm pub in a minute. Pull your finger out. And my depression would go. And James would say to his self, if he's external, what's happening to me to make me depressed? Oh, it's this awful weather. He's screwed. While he believes that the weather's making him depressed and he's out in the weather, he's going to be depressed. So the moment you give it an external attribution, the moment you think you're, you've got a fear of being sick because of your past or because you weren't sick, or because vomit's awful, or any of these external reasons, you're knackered, because you're just going to maintain that belief, because you're not going to challenge it. And that's a big part of what you want to do going through this now, particularly even today. You need to challenge that belief. So what happens is, I can't read it, it's so small. Um, so you look internally, you ask yourself, what am I doing to this? The person feels powerful, that realises they're causing the situation or response, is confident in their ability to cope. The person takes action to change your response. The person achieves a positive outcome, reinforces their sense of power and internality. So James and I, the next day, could be taking a flight to Spain, okay? And, and the plane flight's a little bit bumpy, and we both get a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious. The internal person can think, hmm, Rob, what are you doing to make yourself anxious? Oh, I'm just worrying about this bumpiness in the plane. Well, if I stop worrying, the anxiety will go. So I stop worrying, I have a Jack Daniels and Coke, play the game, okay, and it goes. James says to himself, hmm, what's happening to me to make me anxious? Oh, it's this bumpy airplane flight. Well, you can't change that. So he stays anxious for the rest of the flight. Okay, the moment you give something an external attribution, which you do about a thousand times a day, you are going to stay very, very external. Okay, so even if you didn't have an external locus when your phobia started, by are processing things in a very external, powerless way a thousand times a day, you will have an external locus very, very soon.